I retired from the University of Missouri about 18 years ago. I decided I wanted to spend the rest of my life in a small town, so I moved from Columbia, Missouri to Fairfield, Iowa, a town of about 10,000 people, a small rural community. We have a strong local organization in Fairfield, Jefferson County Farmers and Neighbors, that tried to protect our county from CAFOs. I wouldn't have moved to a rural community that didn't have a strong local organization that's trying to protect their community. But this is your community, not mine, and you have to decide what kind of community you want in the future. And in the next 30 minutes or so, what I'm going to try to convince you of is that you have the power to decide. You have the power to decide what kind of community you want to live in and what kind of community you want your children and your grandchildren to live in into the future. I called the, uh, the title that I came up with was Defending uh, Rural Communities from Economic colonization, and I'll explain that a little bit more later on. But I want to point out that, that when I was growing up in the 40s and 50s in southwest Missouri, we had strong communities. And, and we, it was a time, at that time, coming out of the, after, particularly after World War II, it, it was a time of relative prosperity in many of the rural communities across the country because the, the post-war kind of economic boom had brought prosperity to agriculture as well. And it was a, it was a time of great hope uh, because it, you come out of the Great Depression and then the World War II and then life in rural communities. Rural communities were considered to be great places to live and great places to raise a family and there was real hope for the future that it would continue. And when I was coming up, the tractors had replaced the horses or during the late 40s and early 50s then. And in my part of the world, in southwest Missouri, the Great A Dairy Farms came in, brought a new level of stability and prosperity to farmers. We were on a small dairy farm. My brother's still on that farm today, and he continued to milk cows till he retired when he was 65. But we had a strong rural community and a strong sense that this was a good place to live, and there was real hope for prosperity for rural communities all across the country. There was very little indication at that time that the post-war prosperity that had come after World War II was going to develop into a, an addiction to economic growth and that addiction to economic growth would, would turn the, the potential blessing into a curse not only for the countries, but particularly for rural areas, and the, the hope for prosperity soon turned into a feeling of impotence and dread. And I'll skip forward then to year of uh, uh, 2016, and we see what happened during that inner time. A Wall Street Journal article came out called Rural Communities, the New Inner City. And it pointed out in that article, it said over the past hundred years or so, the time that I was talking about, that, that agriculture and light manufacturing had supported the economies of rural communities. And that between, between charity and the government safety net programs, that the, the poverty in rural communities had been basically taken check, particularly in relation to what was developing in the urban centers at that time during the 1980s, it was the time when the urban centers were being hollowed out by poverty and the people were fleeing to the, to the suburbs because of rising crime and drugs and unemployment and a whole range of things as the industrial economy abandoned the inner city. But they pointed out that, that now rural communities had become the new inner city, the new pockets of poverty. And they pointed out the statistics in rural areas with respect to poverty education levels, teen pregnancy, 10 children, divorce, ill health, cancer, death, employment. In all of those categories, rural areas now rank at the bottom, below the inner cities that are there today. What happened to that dream? What happened to that possibility that we saw back in the 1940s and 1950s? It what happened is what I call economic Colonialism, economic colonialism. 
that's a, that's a common term in, in kind of economic area. I'm an agricultural economist. And what it generally refers to is that when the political colonies that had been taken, you know, back in the early part of the last century, when the political colonies had become unacceptable, then what had happened is that the, the countries had gone into those previous political economies and they simply used their economic power to continue the colonization to continue the domination of the rural people and to control the governments and to extract and exploit the resources of those countries and leave those countries when the resources were gone <coughs> underdeveloped. But what was happening now, it was happening by economic power. And what's different now from the earlier stages of economic colonization is that the power that is colonizing today is not necessarily governments but it's the large multinational corporations. The large multinational corporations that go all the way across the country have become the political power. And they're colonizing not just other countries, but they're colonizing rural communities everywhere around the world. And rural communities around the world are, are losing their sovereignty, their ability to govern themselves as the corporations use their economic power to gain political power and basically take over control of the local government. And the way they get into the communities for the economic colonization, the rural communities, is pretty much the same way that they got into the economic colonization of other areas. What they do is they try to convince people in rural areas that you are basically incapable of economic development on your own and that you need to rely on outside investment. You can simply bring in people, the corporations have the power, they have the money, they'll build you a packing plant, they'll build you the hog operations, they will build whatever, they'll come in. But they say, basically you're reliant on the outside investment. And they'll promise that if you allow the outside corporation to come in and create, they're gonna create jobs, they're gonna create a higher tax base and you're gonna have better schools and you're going to have more health care, and you're going to have better social services because it's going to be good and you're going to have economic prosperity. Now, if the promise of prosperity doesn't work, then what they do is they resort to bribery, much like they did in the old colonies. They go to the political leaders and they say, okay, you own a piece of land, we'll buy it from you, or we'll give you a particular favor, or we'll put you in a position where you'll benefit economically from it. And in the case here, if that doesn't work, then what they do is they say, under the interstate commerce laws of the United States, you do not have the power to keep us out, and they come in regardless. What's fundamentally different in this particular situation is that the, the corporations that now are carrying out economic colonization, they have no capacity for social or ethical values because they're not real people. Before, those that were colonizing at least had the capacity for the concerns for the countries and the people that were being colonized. These corporations are simply economic entities that we created for economic purpose and their only objective is to extract the economic wealth from the natural resources and the human resources to go into the pockets of their investors. That's what they're created for. That's what they're legally required to do. These are the same strategies that were used in political colonization and economic colonization by countries. The promises that are made can tend out to be empty as they have in all cases of colonization before. The promises of prosperity turn into the reality of poverty and communities and countries are left without anything on which to rebuild their economy or their society. We determined after some period of time that political colonization simply was not civilized human behavior. And we substituted for economic colonization and in spite of this, the corporate economic colonization of rural areas continues, not only here but around the world but particularly in rural America. Industrial agriculture, either intentionally or not, has been the primary means by which we have colonized rural communities all across this country. And industrial agriculture is like any other industry. 
with the pollution, the degradation, the exploitation, the extraction. In this case, it's the pollution or the, the de degradation of the soil, the natural source of all productivity, the pollution of the air and water with agricultural chemicals and biological waste. The things we would associate with, with heavy industry. With one exception, agriculture is essentially unregulated. We hear about all the regulations, but you look at where agriculture is regulated relative to industry, and it's essentially unregulated because the traditional family farming operations did not need regulations, and they still don't need regulations. But industrial agriculture is fundamentally different than the traditional family farms that have been out here. And what we see is the industrialization of agriculture. We see the degradation of the soil and the pollution of the water, but we also see the displacement of the traditional family farms that can no longer compete with these big subsidized operations. And they're turning the people, the traditional family farmers in rural communities are being transformed into corporate tractor drivers and hog house janitors. And we're left without people in rural communities that even know how to farm anymore. And when the, rural, when the corporations have depleted the resources and extracted the wealth, then they will leave those communities and you will be left with a polluted environment, the degraded soils, and no farmers there that know how to revive agriculture. Wendell Berry, the farmer and the philosopher and writer, in a response to a, a, a book editor of the New York Times in response to a review of a book that had been made, and I want to quote from him because I think he summarizes what the consequences have been. He says, the business of America has been largely and without apology the plundering of rural America, from which everything of value, minerals, timber, farm animals, farm crop, and labor, has been taken at the lowest possible price. As apparently none of the enlightened ones has seen in flying over or bypassing on the interstate highways. Its two large fields are toxic and eroding. Its streams and rivers poisoned. Its forests mangled. Its towns dying and dead, along with their locally owned businesses. Its children leaving after high school and not coming back. Too many of its children are not working at anything. Too many are transfixed to too many of the various screens. Too many are on drugs and too many are dying. That's the consequences of corporate industrialization and colonization of rural areas. Thankfully, there are people all across the country, people who are here and people in my county and other places around the country that are beginning to wake up. And they are fighting back. And we are finding ways to fight back. And just like the indigenous people before us, even if it's our last stand, we will continue to stand and oppose the colonization of our communities. In spite of the persistent denial of the agricultural establishment, the large corporations, the commodity groups, Farm Bureau, and some others that are defended of industrial as they there is clear, compelling scientific evidence of the ecological, social, and uh, environmental degradation uh, and economic deg degradation of our rural communities. There's a whole wealth of scientific studies going back for more than 60 years now where scientists have been studying this issue. The, the kind of the classic is back in 1944, it's called the Goldsmith Report out in California where this, the sociologist was looking at two different communities. One was characterized by industrial agriculture, contract operations, the other independent family farms. And he documented the difference. The poverty in the industrial community, the poverty was higher, the quality of life was lower, the health of the people were lower, the overall quality of life and standard of life and economic well-being was affected adversely by the industrialization of agriculture we've known as far as back then. You talk about good science, in 2006, the North Dakota Attorney General's Office commissioned a study to study the impact of industrial agriculture on rural communities. 
North Dakota State University professor went back over the 50 year period. They reviewed 56 different studies that had been published in peer reviewed articles dealing with the socioeconomic impact. The conclusion of that study was that the concerns that rural communities had had for the industrialization of agriculture were warranted by the research. He pointed out that 50 years of research on industrial agriculture and the negative impacts had only grown worse as the negative impacts of large-scale confinement animal feeding operations had become more prevalent. 2009, Pew Charitable Trust, an economic study again with several professors come together and they issued a report again based on the 50 years of research and they pointed out that in communities that had the higher industrialization of agriculture, you had greater income and equity, poverty among large sections of groups, decreased business on Main Street, and a diminished overall quality of life within those communities. Another Pew commissioned report, a two and a half year study that was done by including industry people and academic people and people, professors with across the board, they pointed out, they called them industrial uh, livestock production, animal production. And they said that, that, that in their conclusion, they said that what we would call CAFOs here pose unacceptable risk to public health, the environment, and the welfare of the animals themselves. And in their summary, they said that the scientific evidence is simply too strong and the risks are simply too straight, too great to be ignored. And the changes must be made, and the changes must begin now. That was 2008, 2013, Johns Hopkins School of Public Health went in and reviewed the recommendations that they had made, the changes they said had to be made. They concluded that virtually nothing had been done in those five years, and the scientific evidence begins to grow. 2016, International Panel of Experts on Sustainability looked at this on a global scale. They cited over 350 different reports and they called the evidence indicting industrial agriculture as overwhelming. They pointed out that while it had increased productivity, that there was def documented evidence of negative impacts on the soil, the land, the water, biological diversity, greenhouse gases, growing hunger around the world as industrialization of agriculture coupled with an epidemic of obesity and other diet related diseases and decline in rural livelihoods wherever the industrial model is carried all around the world. Call for good science. We've got more than a half century of good science supporting the indictment of industrial agriculture and still it continues to be promoted by those who should be protecting us. Our air and our water is polluted. There are documented public health risks, particularly antibiotic resistance. The World Health Organization, the Center for Disease Control and Prevention, even a, a major summit of the United Nations link growing antibiotic resistance such as MRSA to the livestock feeding operations and the use of antibiotics. And there's growing hunger around the world. I supported this industrial model the first half of my academic career because we were going to make good food affordable for everyone. We didn't do it. Food insecurity or hunger is almost three times as great today as it was back in the 1960s. Roughly one in six of the children in this country live in food insecure homes. It didn't work. The scientific evidence is clear. Our government has failed to protect us from economic colonization. In fact, our state and local governments are aided and abetted in this process and continue to do so. It's time to wake up. And people are waking up. 
There's growing public concerns about the integrity of the food system overall. That's the reason you say the rise in organic and natural and local foods and a whole range of things that we could talk about. It's a reflection of, of growing public concerns. The agricultural establishment has responded to those growing concerns with a, with a multi-million dollar propaganda campaign across the country extolling the virtues of modern agriculture, they call it, and trying to create alternative facts to replace the good science that are out there to, that is out there today. But you know what? These folks know that this public relations campaign or propaganda campaign, that's nothing but a holding action because they know that people are going to wake up. And the biggest thing I think to be concerned about today is they're trying to build a, a legal firewall to keep us from doing anything about this industrial agricultural colonization, even when the people wake up to do it. There's an organization called the American, uh, uh, American Legal Exchange Coalition or Council. And they have a, they've put up put together a whole agenda that they take from state to state all across the country. And you see state legislatures passing laws that have the same wording in it that comes out of it. And if you go to the ALEC, everybody refers to it ALEC. I don't remember what, I didn't remember what it meant to. But if you go to their website, then you'll see what their agriculture policy is. They say the function of government is, is to limit and remove all regulations on agriculture. And it should be based on the recognition that the United States has the safest and most innovative food system in the world and we shouldn't do anything to get in the way of it. That's, that's what's driving the agenda. You go back to the laws that have already been there, where you have the, called the veggie libel laws. Thirteen states carry those, which makes it, makes it e easier to sue people who raise questions about the food system, including college professors or researchers who question and do research and report it. And then there's the ag gag law, six states passed those where it make it illegal to go in and take pictures inside the CAFOs without the consent of the operation. And even if they lose the cases like in the Oprah Winfrey case, it still sends a chilling effect across people that are about to come out and publish something that's detrimental to the food system because you could be sued and you could lose everything just by reporting what you found and knew to be true. And also the ag gag laws have been un declared unconstitutional in some places, but there's still this effect that you may have to fight through the courts in order to protect this right. You know, what we've done is this ALEC and the, and the corporations, they've turned the traditional right to farm, which I thought was a logical law and still think that a, the traditional family farm should not be regulated to the extent you know that they would impose upon their business because they don't pollute an environment and that sort of thing. I'm not saying the small farms can't, but I'm talking about traditional family farm values. It was being a good neighbor. It was taking care of the land. It was taking care of the environment. It was caring about these other things. But they've turned it into a corporate right to harm. They're using this traditional good reputation of the traditional family farmer to say, we're not going to regulate any of agriculture because it's all agriculture. And the new laws are limiting nuisance suits now. Even if you prove a legal nuisance against them, like the laws in Missouri and in Iowa, and if you win the lawsuit, your maximum claim is only the economic depreciation in your value of your property and the health costs that you can, or health care costs you can actually prove are linked to the CAFO. And in essence, these laws give the CAFOs a greater power than the government of eminent domain because once they've settled that initial case, you cannot sue them again. They basically, they can continue to operate the way they want to. They have taken the value of your property. They have compensated you for what you could get through the court, and that's it. That's all you can do. You know, I think this has gone about as far as you can go, but I think we're getting ready to go even further because the new laws that have been come out if you look at the purpose of those laws, they basically say the purpose of those right to farm laws is to make sure that the public interest doesn't get in the way of the economic interest of the agricultural industry that's moving forward. They may not come right out and say that, but the way it turns out to be is that they're saying that there's inevitable conflicts between people living in rural areas and agricultural operations that are functioning there. And so to resolve those conflicts, we're basically going to express legally that these people have a right to carry out their economic activity that trumps the right of the people to live there. 
In Indiana, for example, there's a model ordinance based on the ALEC model again that would prohibit non-farm residents from buying property or living in rural areas. In other words, you couldn't live in an area that had been designated as an agricultural area that used the zoning laws. You could not buy a piece of property to live on in that area unless you worked on a farm or unless you owned a farm in that particular area. So you couldn't do that. In Wisconsin, if you go look at your laws, it basically sets up agriculture as industrial parks and says that you can't hamper anything or any form of technology that agriculture puts in place that is designed to give them the maximum latitude in carrying out and using those technologies basically any way they want to. In Iowa, we set it up with what I call colonization, with encouraging agricultural loans that give priority to the economic interest in the interest of agriculture and on our economy priority over anything else that's going on there and says the intent of that law is to ensure that agriculture continues to be a dominant part of the agricultural economy. If these laws are put in place, basically what we're doing is they will be identifying zones, major areas of counties and say this is agricultural area. And this is basically like an industrial park, but without any regulations. And it's going to be agricultural sacrifice zones that w where, the, where the corporate agribusiness will have a legal right to do basically anything they want to do. And if you don't like it, then you can just get up and move somewhere else. Our rural communities will be turned into toxic waste dumps with polluted air and polluted water and people will leave. The farmers will leave because they won't be able to control the, the pesticide drift or the, or the GMO pollen drift or anything of this nature or the pollution of the water, the pollution of irrigation. Even, even the conventional farmers will be forced out. The wealthy people that own the farming operations won't live there. They'll live somewhere else and what we'll be left with are people that are so desperate for work that they will work in a toxic environment just so that they can feed their families. That's colonization, pure and simple. And if we don't stop it, that's where it's headed. So where's the hope for rural communities? Where is the hope for rural Americans out here? There is hope. The hope is in people. It's in the people of rural communities. Margaret Wheatley, kind of a leading thinker on organization and, and cultural change in a recent report in a book that she's come out with, but she actually presented it, a lecture at at uh, University of Wisconsin in Madison, where I pulled this quote from. She says, the hope is in the clarity that the world changes through local communities taking action. You've heard that earlier today. That's the way the world changes. That's the way it's always changed. When people individually get together with their neighbors and other people and say, look, we have to have change. We have to bring something about. And those people change their community, and that community influences another community, and the other community is influenced, and that's the way the change happens. I think the reason we don't have the change that we have, we don't have it started in the other direction, or we don't have the rejection of industrial agriculture that we have today is because most people simply don't understand what's going on. There are people that understand, and we've heard part of it, the local food movement, the organic food movement, the natural, the pasture-based, the hormone antibiotic free. These are people that want something fundamentally different than out there. There are some people that understand that are rising up and taking action. So what does it take to make people in general take action? What does it take to bring Americans, you know, to get them to come forward? Well, we come together in times of crisis, right? We always do. From nature, you have a flood or a a fire or something of that nature and people will come together, they'll help each other out, somebody gets sick, they'll go help them harvest the cross. But you know when other times that people take action? When you violate a core ethical principle. When people say this is fundamentally wrong, then they take action, they do something about it. We simply haven't reached that point. What does it take? What kind of values would it take to bring people forward? The Institute for Global Ethics did surveys and focus groups all around the world. And they said, sure, every community, a lot of people have different values, but she says there's, there's five core values that people all around the world in different cultures share. And I argue these are strong rule values. And they are honesty, fairness, 
responsibility, compassion, and respect. Anybody want to stand up and, and, and defend being dishonest, unfair, irresponsible, uncaring, disrespectful? These are core values. And when you think about the sighting of CAFOs as just an instant, when you think about the arrogance and indifference in the location, the operation, and the lack of regulation of CAFOs, it violates every one of those core values. People, if the people simply understood, then that's what brings people together. That's what brings people to action. That's what we have to do, is to help people understand what's going on out here. The ELEC agenda is, is not just simply violating the moral code, which it is, but I contend it's violating even our basic constitutional rights. I believe we have a constitutional right to clean air, clean water, and safe, wholesome food. Now those rights aren't, aren't mentioned specifically in the Constitution, except they're mentioned indirectly in the Constitution. Because the Ninth Amendment Constitution says enumeration of certain rights within this Constitution should not disparage or diminish others that are retained by the people. Now some of those other rights have been added later. The women's right to vote, you know, that was one of those rights that wasn't in the Constitution, but we put it in there. Some other rights have been, been implied through the right to privacy, the right to assembly, and some of the others. But where do you look? Where would you look to see what some of those other rights were that were so obvious and self-evident to the people that formed this Constitution that they didn't feel it was necessary to enumerate them? I would argue, look at the Declaration of Independence. We hold these truths to be self-evident. That all men, it should say, people are created equal and they're endowed by their Creator with certain unalienable rights. Among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. What can be more important to the right to life, let alone happiness, than to have clean water, clean air, safe, wholesome food? If we don't have those things, then all of our rights to life have been diminished, if not snuffed out, as they have been in some cases. I would argue that the founders meant for us to claim those rights because they said they were so self-evident and inalienable that they didn't dream of a time when we wouldn't automatically ensure those basic rights of everybody in our society. Our government has failed to ensure those rights, but that constitutional amendment says they're reserved for us. It's up to us. It's up to us to change our government if we have to, and I think we change our government if necessary at the local level. We either convince our local government officials to protect our rights as human beings, our constitutional rights, or we change the governments. And once we've changed in one local community, we can form alliances with other local communities that are doing the same thing, and one by one, one person, one community, one group of communities, one alliance, one state at a time, we can change the whole of the structure and the government within which we function and we can change and reclaim the basic social values upon which this country was founded. And I will just close by pointing out that you people that live in the Driftless, I've been through here a few times, but you have a unique and valuable responsibility to protect this particular precious resource that's not like any other in the country. This, this, is, the, this is kind of the, the cradle of the, of the whole social and cultural values of this whole alternative to industrial agriculture. For the Midwest, this is where the organic movement is emerged and where it's growing out of. This is where this is where the local food movements and various others are out of. This is the home of the, of the Midwest uh, Organic Sustainable Education Society. Everybody calls it MOSES that holds the, the biggest organic conference, the biggest local food conference you put together in the whole country. This is the home of Organic Valley, the biggest natural organic cooperative in the whole country. You probably have more small farmers, more people that epitomize 
the alternative to industrial agriculture per square mile in, in this area than they have anywhere in the country. Th this is a movement that needs to emerge and needs to grow. And while you're protecting the driftless and while you're protecting the alternative to what's wrong here, you're not just protecting this area, but you're helping to fight this whole movement toward the economic colonization of rural America. We need to understand, as we are in Iowa and Minnesota and you in, in Wisconsin, each one of these battles that we fight is just one little skirmish in a bigger war, and each one of those battles gives us an opportunity to awaken people to the reality of what's happening to their communities from industrial agriculture and other forms of economic exploitation. And out of these battles, we can build the alliances that you've talked about here in Wisconsin, that we have in Iowa. We build those alliances, and we can network across the states, and we can network among states, and pretty soon we're bringing about that change, one community at a time, one state at a time, one alliance at a time, until we change the whole that we're dealing with. I'm not naive. The change I'm talking about, I know, is not going to be quick or it's not going to be easy. The political and economic powers defending the status quo are powerful. But there is no power in this country that is greater than the power of the people when people come together and work together for a greater good. The relationships that I talk about are inherently different. It's hard for people to get along. We've been so separated and so competitive and so individually motivated for so long. We've forgotten how to get along with each other and we've forgotten how to bring people together. But we can learn that again. Because throughout our history, even with our independence and our separation and individual initiative, in time of great difficulty, in time of great peril, the American people will come together. And I would argue that people in rural communities are facing a time of great challenge and a time of great peril. And I'm confident that when people understand what's going on, we will come together. The Declaration of Independence, I argued, goes beyond when you named the rights that I talked about. And the next line after life, liberty, and the pursuit of government, it says to secure these rights, governments are instituted among men. That's the purpose of government. But our government has failed us. It's failed to secure those inherent inalienable rights that I mentioned through the Ninth Amendment. But you know what the Tenth Amendment says? It's often quoted. The Tenth Amendment says that powers not granted to the federal government are denied to the states, are preserved for the states or the people. The Ninth Amendment gives us the authority. The Tenth Amendment gives us the power. We simply need to take the power that we have been given with the founding documents of this country and oppose the economic colonization of our communities because there is no power for change greater than a community taking its future in its own hands. We must simply ask who we are, what we value, and what kind of future we want, to quote Mary, and then go out and claim it. Thank you. Thank you.